rise of Rome is truly extraordinary. We look back on it from the perspective that it was ordained, that it was destined to happen. But in reality, it was a very small Greek city-state that rose to such great heights and achieved such enormous success. The world has never been the same. In the middle of the third century BC, Rome itself was very much on the up. It wasn't a massive world power. Rome's expansionism was driven by defensive considerations. They were protecting their own interests or protecting their allies, even if reality meant that they were attacking other people. The military was central to Roman society. It undergirded everything that they did. Rome conquered what we called at the time the known world, and Rome power grew based on fear. When Rome conquered its enemy, it didn't just lead them to their own devices, it moved in, it set up systems. There were points of inclusion, there were points of suppression, and ultimately there's a system that really worked for Rome to remain in power. Rome wants a number of things from the territories it conquers. It wants wealth, it wants glory, and it wants human capital. It wants slaves. By the second and first centuries BC, Rome becomes the greatest slave society in the history of the ancient world. This is slavery on a massive scale, even we might say on an industrial scale. And it's affecting the lives of millions of people in the Mediterranean who are caught in the Romans' nets. They ruled the Mediterranean with their galleys at that point. And so if you came into conflict with Rome, you could count on destruction. In the second century AD, Rome had reached its zenith, its greatest territorial extent. It was kind of like when a roller coaster gets to the very top of a rise and is about to go down the other side. You get this glorious moment of feeling like you're on top of everything, and you're almost unaware that terror is about to start. This happened, I think, to the Romans in the second century. They were sitting on top of the world and weren't aware that in the third century, everything was going to come apart. You could say the Roman Empire's eyes are big in its stomach. It pushed really far out, and then it ended up with an empire which was too big to manage. The first signs of the empire being torn apart from its very fabric is the crisis of the third century. You've got revolts, you've got civil war, hyperinflation, and a string of useless emperors. As the Roman Empire began to crumble and the territories that it had once controlled began to fall away from Roman power and fall into the hands of barbarians, they had to come to grips with the fact that they were no longer the only big player in this game, that they were slowly surrendering power to other people that they had to now treat as equals. Rome was in some senses a victim of its own success. It had become such an incredible source of power and of wealth it became a prize in an unending series of civil wars and political intrigues, which in the end brought about its collapse. The cost of building the kind of imperial power Rome has in the Mediterranean world were enormous. The costs on Roman society were incalculable, and the bill had to be paid. We're amazed that Rome lasted as long as it did. But the fact that it collapsed is not so much a sign that the Romans themselves were weak or had a bad idea in undertaking this project at all. It's more of a sign that empires are bound to go up and down, to rise and to fall. Strategists, tacticians ever since have striven to copy what the barbarians achieved because it represents tactical perfection. We know this land. This terrain is in our blood. Well, a little video case, of course, from History Channel, of course, on the decline of the Roman Empire. Uh, so, of course, that's something we will be talking about today because it does eventually come to an end. So, anyway, uh, this is Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, pretty much Monday. Uh, so if y'all had a good weekend, hopefully. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, looks like we do have a few students watching right now uh, live in the live stream. 
Uh, looks like Amber is still watching. Hey, what's going on? You're doing great out there. Uh, Drake, hey, what's up? I uh, hope y'all are having a great morning, of course. Uh, Matthew, uh, good morning. Uh, Jillian, hey, what's going on? Uh, of course, and also Devani looks like he's also joining us. And also Thai, like Thai Tran also looks like you're there too uh, as well. So if anybody else watch and let me know, of course, uh, or of course, maybe some comments later, of course, whatever you got, of course, about this lecture. So anyway, uh, before I get started, of course, this week, just a few reminders, of course, about various assignments uh, that are out right now. Uh, of course, the main one right now is you got that uh, early Roman history quiz that's still out. That'll be due later in the week. Uh, so make sure you kind of wrap that up. And, of course, over the weekend, you had some big, big assignments, of course, due uh, the book report and that third vocab uh, was also due uh, as well. Uh, so, yeah, if you haven't got those to me, just, you know, send those to me. Of course, I need those, get those graded for you. Because, uh, you know, you don't want to have a zero on those projects because I think there's a fourth vocab or a final vocab that I have already posted already this week, which will be due at the end of the semester. So uh, if you want to be exempt for the final, you know, those that have real good grades, A plus range, uh, make sure you do, of course, finish up on your remaining assignments that you have left. Uh, if anybody wants to join me in StreamYard.com, there's the link right below. Of course, also as well, of course, also send out the link to you, of course, to the YouTube uh, live stream that I've got going uh, right now. So, yeah, today, uh, of course, we'll be focusing on uh, kind of getting into the end, you know, the end of the Roman Empire. We'll kind of get to how it declines, it collapses and all that, which will occur, you know, around the fifth century. Uh, and then, of course, we'll be getting later into the Middle Ages, I think later in the week and Whatever I get last uh, next week, of course, as well, I'll kind of talk about uh, the you know the major events that do happen uh, pretty much in the Middle Ages. We don't have too many lecture days left, so pretty much got this week and next week, uh, and that's it. And then, of course, our final will be of course coming up, which I think our final exam is pretty much going to be on the Roman Empire uh, in whatever I do on the Middle Ages. That's pretty much the last stuff I'll have uh, overall. So if you have any comments, questions about this lecture, uh, of course, in the live stream or later, uh, you, of course, can leave those comments, of course, uh, on my channel, uh, like a bunch of you always do. So anyway, uh, of course, we're up to the point where I think lecture-wise, uh, I'm kind of into discussing, uh, you know, how, how the empire was starting to decline in the third century. I think we talked about that so-called crisis period uh, that occurred. Uh, in in the third century, uh, and uh, I think I think I did talk about I think one of the last things I went into, so I discussed the um, one of those last emperors I believe it was Aurelian, who's one of the ones you remember correctly, who had kind of put the empire back together, kind of restored everything uh, as one whole empire, uh, but I don't think it ever really recovered like it was before. Uh, they of course have a lot of rival powers later uh, that the Romans end up fighting. Uh, and so, yeah, with between the third and the fifth centuries, the empire starts going downhill uh, pretty much. Now, before that happened, there was this other emperor I did want to mention about a little bit today. Uh, he was well known, which was uh, Emperor Diocletian. You see right here, uh, Diocletian um, was famous for making a lot of these reforms to the state. Uh, I think they called different names, reforms of Diocletian. A lot of them were, by the way, temporary reforms, I guess, to kind of prevent the empire from collapsing, uh, I guess, at that point. And uh, a little background about uh, Diocletian. Diocletian uh, actually was from the lower class. He, he didn't come from like an upper class background, which is interesting about him. He was actually the son of a slave, uh, and he rose up through the military. And I don't know if anybody uh, you know, out there, of course, probably nobody's from, you know, Croatia, but he's from there. That's interesting about that topic. He's from a province uh, within the Roman Empire that was called Dalmatia, uh, which would be an area where Cro uh, Croatia is, uh, Serbia, Albania, kind of in those areas of um, the Balkans region of, of kind of like Central Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, so I think it's from Split Croatia is where his 
famous palace, the ruins of it. I think it's still there uh, today. And uh, yeah, he's known for uh, kind of stabilizing the empire, but he, he was also this ruler that began to officially call himself Dominus, uh, which I, remember, I mentioned before that the title Dominus was a title that meant master or lord. Uh, and so the Roman emperors were trying to give themselves more autocratic power, which is part of why they went with that title. And they got rid of the old title, which was Prenceps, you know, the first citizen or whatever it was. And uh, so the period from like his reign up to like the end of the Roman Empire around the fifth century is usually called the dominate, uh, the dominate period of the empire. Uh, and uh, all emperors use that. But there's other titles they also use. Like he also adopted another title, which meant Jovius, uh, which meant um, I think it meant something like something to do with Jupiter um, saying that he was God <laughs> or part God, basically, uh, these emperors. So. Um, the thing that Diocletian is very famous for, of course, I have a map showing this right here, but Diocletian was the one that began to divide the empire in half. That's one thing that the Romans start doing eventually. So they divide into a Western empire and a Roman empire. That's kind of what it looks like later uh, by the fourth century. But he's the one that really would do this. And uh, what happened was the emperors that they create afterwards had a title they went by. Uh, which was called Augustus, which goes back to the first emperor, Emperor Augustus. And the original state was called a diarchy, where it had these two rulers that reigned, one, le one in the west and one in the east, uh, that they had. Uh, and, um, but over time, uh, what happened was uh, Diocletian added these like kind of like junior emperors that were kind of subordinate to the main emperors that were called a Caesar. Uh, and so you have four rulers by 293. Uh, they actually have reigning over the entire empire. And the Romans later call it the Tetrarchy, uh, which meant a Greek government ruled by four. Uh, so you got four rulers. Uh, and um, part of why they did this, by the way, was the fact that you know it was very difficult for one man, like one emperor, to basically control such a vast empire. So it's a lot easier if they had four rulers uh, to control it, control it. And they're often called tetrarchs. I think during that time period is the nickname. They usually call the rulers. So there's a lot of, a lot of times where there's like multiple emperors that actually reign it, reign over it. And um, the tetrarchy system, by the way, how it worked was that it did several things. First of all, obviously it made administration a lot smoother because, you know, each one rules over a smaller region, part of the provinces of the empire. Uh, but you can see also it also created a kind of a means of secession where basically if one emperor died, like the main emperor, there would be some kind of replacement. Uh, so in this case, uh, the emperor in the West, the Augustus, would be replaced by whoever the Western Caesar was, which usually was appointed. Uh, and then the same in the East is how that would basically work. So that's one, one thing that he did uh, that's very famous wasn't around that long. I think it was, I want to say, around about 15, 20 years, uh, the whole system. Uh, but over time, it'll eventually fall apart. But uh, it's something that he's very, very famous for. I'll get to Diocletian later. He is very famous for actually retiring. He actually he abdicated his throne, stepped down, uh, because most emperors tend to, you know, they usually die in power. Hey, Haley, what's going on? Hope you're having a great morning uh, overall. Uh, but um, so, yeah, oh, of course, the other thing uh, that he's known for, which he kind of gets a bad name for, uh, which is true about that. Uh, Diocletian is also, he was, he and the Tetrarchs, the other thing that they, of course, were famous for was they began this social reform, if you want to call it that, <laughs> where uh, they, they began a mass persecution of Christians uh, throughout throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, and what they were trying to do was they were trying to save the traditional, you know, Roman religions uh, throughout the empire they were being practiced throughout the temples. Uh, and uh, a lot of people were not going to the temples. They were becoming Christian instead, like other religions. Uh, and so later they're called paganism. 
Uh, I don't know if you know much about why they called it that, but Christians later called their religions of the Romans pagan because uh, most of the people that practice it the most lived in the country, like out in the country regions. Like the word pagan meant country dweller because uh, it was like the hardest place to really stamp it out and well, you know, all that because I think in the cities they stamped it out first. Uh, and uh, what happened was it led to like a heavy wave of persecutions where Christians throughout the empire uh, were persecuted uh, for their religion. Uh, many were imprisoned. Uh, there were cases where some were even, you know, killed. Uh, it depends on where part of the empire. I know it was more prevalent in the cities of where it was. And of course, they got named after Diocletian. It was called the Diocletianic persecution. It's what it's usually called, which lasted around 10 years. Uh, you can see uh, the Catholic Church called it the Great Persecution, but they're not sure how great it was. Uh, there's kind of been a debate about how many people actually died uh, during this period of persecution. Uh, more, some of the things may have exaggerated. The church may have exaggerated a little bit how many it was. Uh, but they think it actually did the opposite. It actually popularized, you know, you know, Christianity. Uh, people, I guess, felt sorry for them, uh, things like that. And uh, like if you were a Christian and you were found out, like you were in the government or you were in the military, you pretty much would get fired. Uh, maybe in prison, uh, and so, but eventually it'll be, they'll get rid of it over time uh, when a couple of the emperors will eventually realize it's not the right thing to do, uh, and they eventually pass a bunch of edicts that end that. But I'll get to that later uh, when that, of course, occurs. Now, the Tetrarchy eventually does collapse. I'll get to it later, but um, he basically will step down is one thing that Diocletian is very famous for. Why did he step down? Uh, he suffered from some illnesses, which I believe was like a series of strokes that, that hit him. And so he couldn't do his job anymore. And so he had to basically go into retirement. And of course, in what is Croatia, uh, Split, I think the city of Split, uh, of course, is where uh, his palace was. Uh, and so that's where he went and lived the rest of his life until you can see he died in 311 uh, right there. Well, what happened was there was a series of civil wars uh, that followed afterwards. It's usually called different names, but they're often called the civil wars, the Tetrarchy, which would last something like, you know, they last a while, like really up to like close to the 320s, about where they go up to. And what happened, there was a new emperor that came in who became very famous, you may have heard of, named Constantine the Great. He would come to power, which I'll put him right here on the screen. And uh, Constantine uh, was this uh, general uh, that was under one of the uh, emperors in the West. Uh, I think his name was Constantius, uh, and his father had died. And so he tried to seize the throne. Uh, and over a series of, you know, I guess battles in the, pretty much in the West, I think it was, Western part of the empire, Constantine would eventually come to power uh, and become emperor. And eventually over time, he'll even have his own dynasty, of course, named after his family, which was the Constantinian dynasty, which would be around up to about the mid part of the fourth century. So he's going to be really important, Constantine. Constantine, you know, is considered to be, as you know, the first Christian emperor uh, that the Romans have. He'll, you know, start trying to convert the whole Roman Empire uh, to Christianity. And, uh, of course, there's been a big debate about, you know, when he converted. It's, it's like something they always talk about, you know, when did he convert? Did he convert, you know, during the wars or, or did, did he convert, you know, later in his life? Uh, it depends on your source. I think a lot of the Christian sources say that uh, there was a famous battle during the so-called civil wars, the Tetrarchy called the Battle of Milvian Bridge, which I think was in 312. And suppose he had this story where he converted before the battle, where he saw this cross in the sky. And he was told that if he adopted the cross, that he would win the battle. Uh, and so that was the famous story that Christians always tell you know, about it. But they actually think he didn't convert to it on his deathbed. That's when he was actually baptized. Uh, but uh, Constantine was very important. He became a very, very big patron you know, to, to Christianity uh, in the early Christian church. Uh, he heavily influenced it, by the way, uh, the Christian church and its development, uh, more or less. Uh, and uh, he's, of course, considered a saint, uh, I think in the Orthodox Church and I think the Catholic Church, both of them, I think today, uh, you know, overall. So, 
And uh, that's actually uh, on in that picture you're looking at right there. Uh, that's actually an early symbol, uh, of course, that he would adopt, by the way, uh, which is the so-called, uh, they call it the Chi Ro, uh, is what they call it. Yeah, the Chi Ro. And um, yeah, he's the first one to really start adopting like, you know, Christian symbols and, and things like that. And the, the Chi Ro is just the first two Greek letters of the word Christ, Christus, which is, you know, Christ in, in Greek. Uh, and of course, he put it on coins and things like that. And that became one of the first, like I said, symbols that they would eventually use early on. There's other symbols they'll use uh, as well. Like I think they have the fish symbol that, that kind of develops a little later, which is kind of similar to that uh, that you've got there uh, as well. Now, the big thing that Augustus is known for, uh, very, very famous, of course, he issued what is called the Edict of Milan, which was in 313. Uh, when he was the ruler in the West, Western Augustus. And uh, it was like an agreement to basically treat the Christians, you know, nicely instead of like, you know, putting them in prison and all that. Uh, and so starting under him, uh, they began to legalize Christianity. Uh, it was recognized. Uh, they ended the whole, you know, Diocletianic persecutions uh, and all that. He wasn't just the only ruler that did this. There was another emperor in the East as well named uh, Galerius as well, who was a rival emperor. Uh, and uh, he had his own ed edict. They sometimes call the Edict of Toleration or Certica in 311, which actually ended the persecutions in the East. So basically between 311 and 313, uh, you, you stop really having all these persecutions. And so Christians are let out of prison. They get their property back and things like that. Uh, and so Christianity starts to be more of a you know favorable religion uh, throughout the empire. But at that time, like in the fourth century, you get a deal where they kind of practice both. You got Christianity and pagan religions kind of competing against each other. But over time, it's going to go mostly you know Christian uh, in the end. Uh, oh, they had like. Um, like the dynasty, by the way, oh, if I could find it somewhere, but the, they had a dynasty, which was the Constantinian dynasty that they had, uh, which I'd said would rule up to like, I don't know, it's somewhere in the 460s. The, yeah, four, that's the wrong period, I guess. It should be 360s. That's a later one. I don't know what's in there, Theodosian, but the uh, Constantinian one rules up to the 360s and all that. And uh, I think they only had, all the emperors were Christian, by the way, except they had one named, um, I think his name was Julian, Julian the Apostate, I think that reigned. And um, where he tried to convert, I think, the empire back to, you know, uh, paganism. But uh, pretty much those those emperors kind of helped to kind of make the whole empire Christian. But like I said, they're still kind of trying to compete at that point uh, between, you know, the different, uh, religions that they have uh, throughout the empire. Now, the thing I want to get into that's big with Constantine the Great, uh, that's important. Uh, Constantine's the one that uh, formed eventually what became known as the Council of Nicaea. Uh, I usually call it the first one now because there's a second one that meets later in the Middle Ages. And this was a very important ecumenical council where like the, a lot of the early clergy of the Christian church met in Turkey like northern Turkey on the Black Sea. They met there, by the way, to consider like what the religion was going to be, like what kind of theology they were going to adopt, what God was. This is, of course, a big question. They talk about uh, the church canon, like what kind of church laws they'll, they'll adopt and things like that, what kind of books that they're going to use in this new church that they're kind of forming uh, throughout the empire. Uh, the other thing it did, too, is it famously banned forms of Christianity that were considered heretical, that weren't you know, mainstream like it should be. Uh, there was one called Arianism, which was very popular uh, in North Africa. Uh, some kind of Libyan priest named Arius was kind of spreading this new idea, uh, which was called Arianism. And Arianism was like a top type of uh, uh, Christian religion. Uh, Christ, you know, Christian theology, where they believed that God was made up of two parts, uh, which were like the Father and the Son. Uh, and the Father, the Father begot the Son, but they weren't equal with each other. Like I think, I think the Arian Christians actually believed that the Father was greater than the Son. And that's something they didn't really want to do. 
uh, because they thought Jesus was you know the most important part of that, their religion, Christianity. Uh, and so the Council of Nicaea rejected Arianism for what they call Trinitarianism, for the so-called Trinity uh, that you, of course, heard of. And um, it's the belief that God was composed of three components that are all the same. Uh, Father, the Son, you know, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that becomes the basis of Christian faiths later, most of them, just about, except maybe Unitarianism and a few others. Uh, but pretty much most of your Christian faiths, like whether it be Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant or whatever, kind of believe the same thing, uh, more or less about the Trinity. Uh, now, the forced Christians, by the way, to adopt the Trinity, they came up with this thing called the Nicene Creed, uh, which was a type of uh, prayer of faith that they put into like the, the mass, like Orthodox Catholic churches uh, later. Uh, and uh, the word creed means from the uh, Latin word creda, which means I believe, as in I believe in the Trinity. Uh, and so uh, you were basically forced to say that uh, so that you wouldn't be Aryan. Christian, you know, things like that. So try to ban that and pretty much still like that today. But um, Aryan Christianity is around up to the Middle Ages. In fact, some of the like barbarians like in the West, like the Germanic peoples, actually practice it for a while. Uh, and then up through the Middle Ages, I think they they were practicing it like parts of France and so on. So it's, it's, it's around a while, uh, but they try to stamp it out uh, over a long period of time. Uh, the other thing the Council of Nicaea did, which was kind of famous, was they also set the dates for like Easter, like when it is uh, and all that, which usually they, they made it coincide with like the time of Passover, because the belief is, is that's when Jesus was crucified, was like on the eve of Passover, which is usually in the spring, like, you know, March, April, May, that time period. Uh, so, so that's basically why it's there. That's why Mardi Gras kind of moves around and stuff like that, because uh, it's really based off of the Jewish calendar originally of where Passover, because every year Passover changes because the Jewish calendar is based on a lunar calendar, which is kind of a problem. And the Roman calendar is based on a solar calendar. Also, the Christian Sabbath was moved to Sunday. Why did they, why did they do that? Well, it used to be on a Saturday, but, you know, the, the pagans and the Jews had their Sabbath on, you know, Saturday, all that. So that's part of why they moved it. But also the fact that Jesus, uh, you know, uh, was crucified on a Sunday. Well, I, I, oh, actually, I'm sorry, he rose on a Sunday is what it is, actually. Uh, and so that's hence the why they did that. So, uh oh, there's one more thing that happened, too, which is uh, very famous that they think Constantine also, he, they think he commissioned the first Bibles, uh, especially like the New Testament and all that. Uh, which was compiled, I think maybe 330s B, uh, CE is about when it was, 331 maybe, uh, roughly. And um, it's at that point that they decide like what books are going to go into the, you know, the canon of, of the Bible. Uh, and so all the gospel, you know, stories and things like that were, were voted on by the, the Council of Nicaea. They say it was a very close vote. Like almost 50 50. They couldn't quite decide which books you know should go in there, which gospels. And of course, the ones they have now, Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John, are the ones that they would eventually pick uh, at, at that time. Oh, by the way, uh later in like the fourth century, late, late, like late fourth century, like 380s, they think it was, uh, the famous church father, Saint Jerome, he would translate the Bible uh into Latin. Now, the so-called Vulgate edition, they call it. And the Vulgate edition became like the standard Bible uh, of the Catholic Church, uh, as you know. And so the Catholic Church in the West, they use Latin, you know. And then the Orthodox Church in the East was in Greek. They have the Greek Bible, things like that. And so you got these two competing Bibles that they've got uh, pretty much that they both use overall in the Christian world. So that's that's all that's all the stuff Constantine did. I think you know you can almost say Constantine was one that really founded the whole Christian Church, really, because of all the influence that kind of went into it. And there was a big bishop under him that was real important, called the Bishop of um, uh, his name was uh, Eusebius of Caesarea. He, he was like really influential uh, at the time, uh, and he's the one that kind of helped to help compile the I think the, the New Testament at that time. Uh, now, there's one more thing that Constantine also did that's, of course, you probably heard about this. He founded a new capital 
uh, which of course became known as Constantinople. Uh, and this was a capital, of course, that was located uh, in the uh, eastern part of the, of, of the Roman Empire. Uh, in fact, it was a Christian city. That's what it's famous for. Uh, they became a new capital based in western Turkey. It's actually near the Black Sea, which I can kind of go back uh, to this map right here. But you can see it's right here in the map uh, on the east right right hand side of it, right here where it says Constantinople. And uh, of course, it's located on um, on the um, western side of um, like western Turkey, but on the European side. Uh, closer to like Romania, Bulgaria today. And uh, it's located kind of south of the Black Sea. Uh, so it's kind of located in a location which was very uh, close to like where a lot of the trade routes were running in from east to west. So, you know, the Romans were trading with like Asia and China and all that. Uh, and so it was a way to kind of control trade. Uh, also, I think Constantine realized that the empire in the west was starting to decline. Uh, and so... They're trying to focus more in the East. Uh, and also, I think Constantine wanted to create a, like a Christian city, which Rome was kind of, I guess, a mix of, you know, Christian and pagan. And so his idea was to create this Christian city with Christian churches and things like that. Over time, what ends up happening, as you know, uh, this empire uh, will later be part of what they call the, it's, it's basically the capital of the so-called Eastern Roman Empire or what they call the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but some people also call it Romania. There's another name I think they called it too. Because uh, they call themselves Romans in the East. Uh, Byzantine or Byzantine is more of a later name that historians kind of call it uh, because the fact that um, they think that um, Constantinople uh, was originally built on uh, top of another city uh, that was already there that was called either Byzantium or Byzantium. It's spelled either way, uh, they believe. And that's sometimes a name that they sometimes use to describe the Byzantine Empire later. It was like a Greek city that went back to the Greek times that was there near the Black Sea. And he built it on top of it. Uh, and, um, and it was built on a peninsula, which I'll get to later in another lecture, uh, where it was heavily fortified. So easily protected compared to, say, Rome, uh, which was declining. Uh, and um, over time, they had different names for it. Like Constantine did not want to call it after himself. He actually wanted to call it New Rome, where I think no Nova Roma was the name he was going to call it. But the people didn't like that, and they named it after him. Uh, but there's actually another case where people would often call it just the city, because that was the only big city that had that area. It's kind of isolated region at the time. So they, they say call it the city, or let's say, oh, they would say also, let's go to the city. I think is what they would say, or some, or in the city. Uh, and so over time, uh, that's where they get the uh, more modern name of Constantinople, which is uh, Istanbul, uh, which supposedly is the Turkish variation of that saying, to go to the city or in the city, hence the name. So that's pretty much Constantine's legacy. You know, he pretty much, you know, would, would create what would be this new capital in you can see him also as the founder, by the way, of what would be the Byzantine Empire that will develop over time. And that's around a long time, the Byzantine Empire, but it's not a powerful state compared to, say, the traditional Roman Empire that was there before. All right. Let me also get into and talk about another emperor uh, who was uh, very famous uh, that they have, uh, whose name was uh, Theodosius. Uh, uh, yeah, the great. I don't really have too much on him. Uh, but he's another emperor I'll kind of briefly talk about. Uh, he was pretty powerful. He reigned at the end of the 4th century. This was after the uh, Constantinian dynasty kind of uh, declined, basically. Uh, this was considered one of the last major dynasties that you actually have before the empires kind of split because they don't get back together, uh, as you know. And uh, one thing about Theodosius I'll talk about later, uh, he was really considered one of the first one of the last emperors that really reigns over both the East and the West, which is something Constantine did uh, for a short time. He also reigned, I think, for about 13 years as sole ruler of both the East and the West. And uh, the thing that um, Theodosius is very famous for, he's the one that would try to force the state to convert to all to Christianity. He has this edict. 
he issued in 380 called the Edict of Thessalonica. And what it did was it basically made Nicene Christianity the state religion of the whole empire. So other religions would not be official religions you know, anymore. Uh, in fact, he began to ban them. Uh, any kind of pagan religions, like the old traditional religions that worship Zeus, you know, Jupiter or whatever, and some of those other gods, Mithra, whatever it was uh, they had before, those would be banned. Any kind of heretical type religions, like Arianism, et cetera, uh, would be banned uh, also as well. And um, it didn't include like the Jews. I think they weren't really considered, you know, like pagans or Christians and things like that. Uh, so they weren't really counted. I don't think they tax the Jews anymore at that point. Uh, but uh, Theodosia was also known for banning like the Olympics, which I think maybe 393 CE or AD uh, may have been the year uh, when they think he had him banned. And he had him banned because he felt that it was too pagan, like these pagan rituals that were kind of associated with, you know, the, with, you know, those sporting events, uh, those had to go. Uh, and so, that's something they start seeing, like between the fourth and fifth centuries, you know, you still get, you know, people that still, you know, cling to the old pagan religions, but that's why they call them pagan, because they're mostly in the country, you know, regions, uh, more isolated regions of the empire. And so, like I said, the word pagan meant country dweller, because those that had that still. Uh, oh, also, one more thing about Theodosius. Uh, he, like I said, was the last Roman emperor to actually reign over both halves. So for like maybe three years, 392 to 395, he actually reigned in the West and the East, uh, both both Augustes. Uh, and then he had these two sons he had named Honorius uh, and Arcadius. You may have heard of them before. Uh, I think, I uh, forget which, which was which, uh, but... Um, Anyway, um, one ruled over the western part of the empire, or Norius, and then Arcadius, you see, ruled over the eastern half of the empire. And after that, they never got back together. That was it. They divided the empire in half. That's what you're looking at right there uh, in that map I just showed you earlier, 395. That's pretty much uh, how they divided it up uh, after that. And like I said, they never, they never got back together and put them back together, of course. Although Justinian... Emperor Justinian would try. He would try to get back part of the West uh, in the 6th century, which was really unsuccessful. But uh, this is pretty much the way it looks at this point, uh, at the turn of the, the 4th into the 5th. Yeah, yeah, the turn of the 4th and the 5th century uh, overall. Now, I want to get into the last thing, of course, today to talk about, which is the fact that the empire is eventually going to fall apart, you know, especially in the West. We'll get the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, that you have, uh, and uh, there are a lot, a lot of causes of why the, the the Roman Empire in the West declined. I mean, you can go through a list of them here: economic stagnation. You know, you get the fact that the economy is not as good as it used to be. Trade is also broken up uh, throughout the empire. Disease was a problem too. They think bubonic plague and other types of illnesses may have helped to depopulate them. Also lead, I don't know if you know about the Romans, but they put lead in a lot of things like plumbing, lead plates and things like that, uh, which also contributed to lower birth rates and things like that. Uh, Christianity, believe it or not, is sometimes kind of seen as a cause of a decline because uh, you got the changes between pagan and Christian. That kind of, they think, may have caused some things as well. Decline of the Roman military. The Roman armies were not as powerful later. A lot of their weapons were not as bad either. A lot of their uh, money was debased a lot, so it wasn't worth as much. And then, of course, the big thing they always talk about that, occur, of course, occurs within the Roman Empire is that the Roman Empire, as you know, gets invaded. Uh, they have all these different invasions uh, that take place, uh, which really is the main cause of why the Roman Empire fell in the West. So you get the so-called migration period that comes in where all kinds of people attack the empire in the West, uh, whether it be Germans, non-Germans like the Huns and other groups that come in, Muslim forces, uh, you got those, the Avars and other peoples, Mag yeah, the Magyars and Hungarian type peoples that come into the empire, Huns. Uh, and um, 
So it's like multiple waves of this uh, that actually happened. Like from the fourth century up to like, go up to up to like the Vikings and all that, you get waves and waves of different peoples that come into uh, that part of Europe, not just the West, but also the Eastern part uh, as well. And um, in, in Europe, especially in Germany, they talk about the so-called migration of the Germanic peoples, uh, which they often called it the Volker Wandering, which meant the so-called wandering of the people. And you get this case where a lot of Germanic people start moving uh, from, from Germany into parts of other parts of Europe. And part of it was to come into the empire, which was more prosperous. I mean, a lot of people want, like, people want to come to America because we're a prosperous country. That's why these people from Latin America are coming here because uh, they can have better jobs, make more money. Uh, but it was also, they were fleeing other people. I don't know if you know about that. A lot of the Germans were fleeing groups like the Huns that were coming in that were more barbaric. Uh, and so that had a lot to do with it uh, as well. Uh, then also the Romans uh, wanted the Germans to come in because they wanted soldiers. They didn't have enough men uh, to populate their armies. They also needed more taxes as well, uh, you know, to pay for everything. And so if you know about the Romans hired a lot of these Germanic peoples mostly as mercenaries. They called them federati, uh, which I think was a, a term that meant uh, ally, but it meant really barbarian because uh, if you know about what happened, they weren't treated very well. Uh, but the federati were like these auxiliary forces that were put within the, you know, the Roman armies where you had Roman and Germans fighting kind of side by side. Uh, but over time, what happened, if you know what occurred, I think by the you know, up to like the fourth the century, most of the army started becoming more and more German is what occurs. Uh, now, there were different kinds of peoples that eventually invaded the West. Uh, primarily, these are kind of a list of the big ones that are well known, but you had like groups like the Goths. Uh, they were well known that came out of German, uh, Germany or Northern Europe, uh, which are divided, you can see, in the Visigoths and Ostrogoths. They got the Vandals, uh, they got the Franks, Burgundians. Uh, you've also got the Anglo-Saxon peoples that come out of Northern Europe. Uh, as well. So a lot of these were different kinds of groups that come and you can even see this map here like the different types of um, peoples that kind of invade. They they invade the east too. They attack the eastern part of the empire as well. Uh, but most of them attack the west because it's more weaker uh, as a state. Uh, and uh, primarily what happened to cause the Germans to attack the empire was when they were brought in, they were treated very badly especially the so-called Goths. The Goths were treated kind of like second-class citizens uh, and all that. They couldn't intermarry with other, you know, Romans and stuff like that. And so a lot of them eventually what would happen was they would revolt uh, against against the, um, they rebelled. Uh, and of course, one of the first groups that did this was the so-called Visigoths who formed their own armies internally uh, within the empire under a king named King Alaric. Uh, who's famous in the early 400s, uh, and um, they would actually, uh, you can see here in this map, they would actually invade the empire from east to west. Uh, I think they start like over here, uh, right here, and um, they actually attack the eastern empire first. Uh, you can see 378, the battle of Adrianople, actually killed the emperor of the east named Emperor Valens. He was killed in battle. And then from there, uh, the Visigoths attacked Greece. Uh, they went into Dalmatia, uh, Rome. Uh, in 410 CE, uh, they actually they actually sacked the city of Rome, uh, which, by the way, um, at that time, uh, Rome was not the capital of the West anymore. It was a city called uh, Ravenna, uh, which I think I had on the screen a second ago. You know, Ravenna had become the capital in 402. Uh, CE, which it will be in the West. Uh, I think the re pretty much rest of the time after that, it's not Rome anymore. It gets sacked multiple times, by the way, Rome. Uh, and um, I think so. Yeah, a lot of Germanic peoples tend to be kind of bigger and taller, especially as, as you go further north. I'm of Germanic background, too, on my, my father's side. Uh, and yeah, I'm pretty big, too. I'm like six foot two or something like that. Weigh about 215. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm pretty big. 
So yeah, a lot of Germanic peoples are pretty big, uh, especially if you go up to Scandinavia. They're like they're like they're like six foot two or something like that. So yeah, they they were bigger men, and they and, and all that. So so that's true about that. But uh, anyway, um, so so yeah, well, kind of like you can see this map here. So they they would sack they would sack there, and then you they kept going westward, uh, and um, anyway. Uh, they settled in what is Spain, uh, forming their own state, uh, which was eventually called the Visigothic Kingdom, which is, by the way, around up to like the 8th century. Uh, and they're really in there and also the Iberian Peninsula and also southwestern France is where the Goths will be right there. And I guess Alaric was one of the founders of that particular state uh, that they will have. So you got that state originally. Uh, then they had another uh, kind of a cousins of the Goths, which were the so-called Ostrogoths. They invaded from the east originally as well, like Eastern Empire. They marched westward, which was more weaker, uh, and they would seize uh, what is Dalmatia in Italy, and they would form the so-called Ostrogothic kingdom in the late 5th century uh, as well. And so you have this other Gothic kingdom that formed as well. So you got one in Italy. You got one in Spain that you've got at that point. Uh, you've also got the Vandals as well. The, Van the Vandals. The Vandals were also from Germany too. And um, they invaded Western the Western Empire, but they did something different. They actually came through the Western Empire. And you can see in that blue, uh, they crossed the actual Mediterranean Sea into North Africa. And... Um, they seized the area where Carthage was, took it over, and they formed their own state, uh, which was called the Vandelic Kingdom. That is what they called it later, which is around up to like Justinian's time before he came and sacked it uh, in the six, in the 500s. Uh, and so it's around for a short time. Uh, Kingdom of the Vandals or Vandelic Kingdom is usually pronounced either way, I guess. They had a famous king named King Gazeric. Uh, he was like, I guess, their founder. And uh, he was notorious for also sacking Rome uh, in the year 455. So it's like in a, in a period of like something like uh, like 50 years, Rome gets sacked twice. It's horrible uh, with that. And um, I don't know if you've heard of St. Augustine of Hippo. He later would go on to write a book about that called The City of God, trying to explain like how can we have Christianity when all these barbarians are sacking like Rome and so on. Uh, and so that's like the time period we're kind of talking about uh, overall. Uh, also further west, you got also the Franks, the Franks who were in Germany as well. Uh, they invade Gaul, you know, where France is. They take it over eventually. And they'll form their own state as well, which we'll get to. We'll get to that state later. Uh, the kingdom of the Franks or Frankish kingdom. That's around a long time. It's around up through like the early Middle Ages uh, from like the 5th to about the 10th century. Uh, and uh, they call their region of where they settle, they call it Francia, which is where you get the word France from, you know. Uh, the word Frank or Franks, like the money uh, comes from, of course, uh, as well. Uh, so you got that state as well. Uh, the Franks will be important later, by the way, because that's the, one of the states that helps to kind of develop Western medieval Europe in the future. You got famous rulers like Charlemagne, you've probably heard of. Uh, then they have the Anglo-Saxon peoples, the Angles, uh, the, the, the Jutes, uh, the Saxons. Uh, they came out of northern Germany and maybe Denmark. Uh, and what happened was they crossed the North Sea uh, into England and conquered it uh, over time, like between like, like the about the 5th century or so. And uh, it forced the Romans to evacuate the Ro Roman Britain. Uh, is what occurred with that. Uh, and uh, over time, the Anglo-Saxon peoples will kind of create states there. Like you may have heard of some of these later, Wessex, East Anglia, Northumbria, Mercia, Sussex, Essex, Kent. I think those are the big major ones that they had. Wessex was the most famous, of course, because of Alfred the Great, uh, probably the first great English king you hear about later in the Middle Ages, but they'll they'll have these, you know, rival states that'll over time form the Kingdom of England. Uh, so, so that's kind of all these different Germanic peoples that are kind of, you know, starting to take over 
over the, the empire and kind of carve it up. It's mostly in the West that you have. Uh, then you've got one more group I'll talk about, of course, who's very, very famous that comes in next. You've got the Huns uh, that come in, of course. They're, they're also another factor of why the Western Empire would collapse uh, overall. And uh, who were the Huns? The Huns were these nomadic peoples that came out of Asia. Uh, they believe uh, maybe close to Mongolia. Uh, and I don't know if you remember who the Shang Nu were. We were talking about ancient China a long time ago. Uh, but they think they may have been descended from. There's a big debate about how they're related. Uh, but it's believed that the Huns somehow migrated across Asia into Europe. And they were fierce horsemen. They fought with bow and arrow, you know, uh, and, and swords. And they also were the ones that introduced the so-called stirrup uh, to Europe. Uh, and um, they are often called the scourge of the earth because a lot of people thought they were sent to kill Christians by the devil uh, or by God even to punish people. They are very paganistic. Uh, they, they, really, they weren't Christian uh, like the Germanic peoples converted to uh, and all of that. They are very warlike. They're kind of like the Mongols as they came across Europe. And I think later in World War I when the Germans were fighting uh, the other European powers, they kind of compared them to that, like the Huns, uh, et cetera. That's how bad they, they thought they were. Uh, of course, one of the most feared leaders of the Huns that I think everybody's heard about is Attila, right? Attila the Hun, uh, of course, who's well-known. Uh, and uh, Attila uh, was their greatest ruler uh, who reigned uh, from about the 430s up to about maybe 453 CE, uh, of course, known as Attila or just Attila the Hun. Uh, and, of course, you can see he was often called the so-called scour uh, scourge of God. That's what they called him because uh, everybody thought he was sent by God to punish people. Uh, and um, Attila, Attila uh, was pretty powerful. Uh, he, if you look at this map I showed earlier, they think the Huns eventually would settle uh, in an area that is kind of like right above the Roman Empire. It would be kind of like in a... In a area that's kind of like right here, kind of like between both empires. It's kind of like around where Austria and Hungary is today, really Hungary, about right here uh, in Europe. And uh, there, and also an area that was called at the time, uh, which is about like right here, Pannonia, that they called it. Yeah, Pannonia. I think it's like right here, Pannonia. And um, uh, anyway, what happened was um, he basically – began using his armies to attack both empires, both the East and the West. I think he attacked the East first. And uh, they were kind of like a parasite, the Huns. Uh, they would basically attack them, and if they, did, if, they, if they paid them off, they would just go away. That's what they would do. And so both empires were having to pay them off <clears throat> and all that. And sometimes if they couldn't pay them enough, they got attacked. And... Um, like under uh, Emperor Theodosius II, he was the ruler at the time, uh, I think the grandson of Theodosius the Great, uh, he had to basically, you know, fight against Attila's forces who tried to attack him in the 440s uh, and um, got so bad that the Romans in the east uh, had to build massive fortifications to, to block these barbarians, the Goths, you know, the Huns uh, from attacking them. And so they built what they call the Theodosian Walls. The Theodosian Walls became some of the tallest walls ever built uh, at Constantinople, which I think some of the walls were like 50, 60 feet tall. Uh, they were actually built at one point. And um, so that actually worked, prevented really uh, from really Constantinople from falling uh, in the east. And uh, the Roman armies in the east were better than the west, which was kind of important. Uh, Attila also attacked the West, too. You know about this. Uh, he amassed, uh, and uh, he wanted to go after Gaul uh, at that point next, France. And so what happened was it forced the Romans in the West to, to actually amass a huge army to oppose Attila's forces. You can go to this map here. Uh, you can see how Attila crossed the Rhine River region <clears throat> into what is um, uh, France today. Uh, and um, Bal Shalons, which is right here, 
It was also called uh, uh, multiple names. They call it also Catalonian uh, Plains or also known as Catalonian Fields. It's called multiple names. It happened in June of 451. And what happened was the Romans put up this massive army, which was composed of Roman and German troops, you know, like Federati. Uh, and uh, on one side, you had the Roman general, Aetius, who, by the way, was part, I think, part Goth himself. And then um, we had Theodoric the Great. He was a Visigothic kingdom king as well. He was involved also as a king that was fought with them. And uh, that battle was important because it, it basically repulsed Attila's forces and uh, pushed him back into Germany. Uh, and so uh, he never returned to, to really conquer France. Uh, however, in the year 452, Attila came back again uh, to try to, at this time, attack Italy. He thought maybe he could take Rome and Ravenna uh, as well. Uh, and so um, he was notorious. Like Attila was an awful uh, uh, conqueror. He would actually take cities and literally just massacre the whole population, even kill not just men, but women and children, just kill them all, uh, put them to the torch. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, what happened was uh, the Catholic Church intervened on uh, 452. The Pope at the time, Pope Leo the Great, they call him, or Pope Leo the First, he actually went and he met with Attila, like personally. They had this famous meeting together. And somehow he was able to talk Attila out of invading Italy uh, and to march out. And uh, they're not sure what, how he did that. There's a lot of speculation about today. Maybe paid him off. They don't know. Uh, but they do know that Attila's forces were also riddled with disease, some kind of plague uh, that was hurting his troops. And so he went back, you know, hungry. Uh, he probably would have come back. I think if Attila wouldn't have died in 453, uh, he probably would have conquered the West. I think some people think that would have occurred, but apparently well, a strange thing happened to him. He got married uh, in 453. And on his wedding night, uh, he must have drank too much or something, and it caused a really bad nosebleed, and he choked on his own blood and died. <laughs> so uh, a lot of Christians were kind of, I think, you know, thought that was a miracle uh, when he died. But in the end, you know, the Roman Empire didn't have that many days left, like in the West. Uh, and um, they have actually one more major emperor that they talk about in the West uh, who comes to power. Who's this boy they always talk about uh, named Romulus Augustulus, or Augustus, they call him as well. Uh, and uh, he's considered to be uh, the so-called last Western emperor. Uh, that's forced to step down. Uh, he's four, I think he was 13 when he came to power. Uh, they call him either Romulus Augustus, or they usually call him Augustulus, which meant little Augustus. Uh, and anyway, the Germans, like I said, were taking over the West, like all these different uh, different Germanic peoples. And so they had this German general named Odo Acer. He, he basically forced him out of power uh, in 476. I think he was given a pension or something like that. They make a, they have a great movie, I think, came out about that a while back. I remember seeing uh, that kind of covers this period. Uh, and But he's forced to step down, and they don't know what happened to him. That's kind of been a debate about what happened to Rom. Well, they think he may you know, die of natural causes or he may have been murdered. You're not sure. It's kind of a big mystery about that. But afterwards, there's no Roman emperors that are really proclaimed in the West. They don't have any. Uh, although there's an emperor in the East named Emperor Zeno uh, who claims that he's the emperor in the West, you know, like sole emperor of both empires. But pretty much a lot of the um, German peoples don't really recognize anybody. And I think it was even a case where they sent the uh, Roman insignia back uh, to the emperor in the East saying, we don't want an emperor, you know. And so 476, that's usually kind of put as the popular date when the Western Roman Empire ends. Uh, however, people still in the West see it as an empire. You know, people, I think, up to, I want to say, into like the 6th century still call themselves Romans, stuff like this, you know, later. 
And uh, they had this man named Edward Gibbon. You may have heard of him. He's a very famous uh, British historian uh, in the late 18th century. He, he kind of popularized this whole idea of 476. And um, Gib Gibbon, um, you know, um, that famous work was really one of the first modern works that really began a study, you know, why the Roman Empire, you know, collapsed, like declined and all that. Uh, and so that's why you have all these other modern historians that kind of follow later. And it's like a huge work. Uh, I don't know if you ever read it. I read it years ago, uh, but it's like six volumes. Uh, they, were, they were written over a period of like 13 years uh, that it took him. So, uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, the, the decline of the Roman Empire, it's, it's basically, it, it's, you know, pretty much the West is gone. Uh, you get this case where, you know, you get these medieval states that kind of form in the West, uh, which are heavily influenced by the Germans. We'll see that later. And then you do have the medieval medieval period. The Middle Ages kind of follows uh, after that. Also, I will talk about the Byzantine Empire. I'll kind of, for a few minutes, maybe uh, later in the week, I'll kind of talk about the early stages of that. That kind of develops most in the East, but it was a weaker version, like a kind of a Greek version too, of the Roman Empire, which will shrink over time. It's kind of conquered by other states, mostly Islamic states like the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but um, the legacy of the Roman Empire is that it's heavily influenced the world. You know, a lot of people in the West, you know, still influenced by by their by their by their people, their language, you know, their their religion, uh, you know, architect. There's all kinds of things that, of course, uh, that are still you know, affect the world. Uh, but I think the Greeks and the Romans probably affected the West more than anything as various peoples, uh, like in Europe and all that. So that's it for pretty much this lecture uh, on, of course, the, the Roman period. Uh, like I said, later in the week, I'll be, of course, moving on to talk about the Middle Ages. Uh, and so if anybody else you know, has any questions later you know, about this, this lecture, you know, let me know. Uh, don't forget, like I said, you've got that, you know, that quiz on, like, I think it's on the early Roman period that you got to finish up. And like I said, you still haven't sent me your book report uh, and uh, that, that last vocab, just, you know, get that to me uh, so I can, of course, have those graded. So that's it for today. I uh, hope y'all have a great week overall. We only have like two weeks left. We got this week and, of course, next week that we have. And then, of course, finals, of course, coming up after that. So it's going to go pretty quick uh, and all that. So y'all take care uh, and have a great rest of the week, like I said. So y'all take care.